On April 20th, 1999, 17-year-old Dylan Claybold and 18-year-old Eric Harris came to school with a small arsenal and several homemade explosive devices. Harris and Claybold began shooting at approximately 11.18 a.m. Police responded in force, but only to set up a command post on the school's football field, far away from the massacre going on inside the high school. Okay, calm down, okay? Well, I think we're entire information is on where our children are. We have a lot of units out there right now. Tell me, I can't get anywhere near it. I want to find out how to get in touch with my daughter. How do I get Harris and Claybold were allowed free reign of the school to shoot their teachers, fellow students, and set off their pipe bombs. Stay low. If you try to leave, I don't want you to get shot, okay? Stay very low and quiet. So, stay low, stay low, and quiet. Stay low, stay low. Apparently satisfied with their killing spree, Harris and Claybold committed suicide roughly one hour from the time the first shot was fired. But the police still held their position out on the lawn for another hour before the first SWAT teams cautiously made their way into the school. A large explosive. You can see at the bottom of your picture just how far an officer has moved back. They have yet to give us the all clear on this west side of the parking lot. And again, we'd like to emphasize only through technology, the Sky 9 camera, are we able to bring you this close a picture because we are quite a distance away in the interest of safety. And whether or not they have found it... Harrison Claybold had been dead for more than three hours by the time those big, brave policemen finally got to the students and staff still clinging to life in the school library where most of the massacre occurred. The Columbine High School incident wounded 24 people and took the lives of 15, including the shooters. It also justified school uniforms, dress codes, metal detectors, and a visible police presence in public schools across the United States. This effectively trains children to give up their identity, their privacy, and submit to the authorities. It was a terrifying situation for thousands of people, gunmen in the neighborhood killing individuals in a methodical way. When the news got on the radio and the television, people were too frightened to go outside. It happened again and again and again. This is what it's been like in Montgomery County, Maryland, which is basically part of Washington. ABC's Barry Serafin is our reporter there tonight. Barry? Well, Peter, virtually every law enforcement agency in this area, including local police, the FBI, U.S. Marshals, and Secret Service, is looking for whoever is responsible for the worst murder spree that has ever happened here, including a murder today at the service station behind me. The Washington, D.C. sniper was the next sensationalized terror scheme. Although the shooters were only targeting the Washington, D.C. area, the corporate news hyped the story all over the country. Uh, this is a very safe community. Uh, our homicide rate just increased by 25% in one day. Law enforcement sources say the weapon was a high-power rifle, fired in some cases at least from a distance. We feel like we probably have a skilled shooter, uh, and, and that does heighten our concern. On December 25, 2009, a young man on a transatlantic flight from Amsterdam to Detroit attempted to detonate a small amount of explosive he had been concealing in his underwear. The material caught fire but failed to explode. But that was only the beginning of the story that unraveled from the events of this Christmas Day flight. You also have some different theories about this suspect in the most recent um, attempted bombing on yes. the airplane. You, uh, we are told that it's a Nigerian man who is associated with Al Qaeda. You're saying there's something that we're missing here. Well, that, that's uh, the the fact is that this is a protected patsy. In other words, this is a puppet. This is somebody who's an asset controlled by U.S. intelligence. Uh, this is a way to stage a provocation. We've had four days of wall-to-wall -wall hysteria worldwide about this. Let's just look at a couple of facts.
facts. His father, a rich Nigerian banker, went to the U.S. Embassy in Nigeria on the 19th of November and said, my son is in Yemen, he's at a terrorist training camp, do something about this. Ne nevertheless, the son is allowed to buy a ticket in Ghana, paying cash, $2,800, for a one-way ticket. He can get on the plane in Nigeria after entering Nigeria illegally, and when he gets to Amsterdam, he's apparently, I think, a mental deficient who can't make it from one gate to another. So according to an eyewitness account, there's a well-dressed Indian man who brings him to the gate for the U.S. flight and says, my client here or my friend here doesn't have a passport. Get him on. He's Sudanese, and we do this all the time. So you're that's saying impossible. there's no way this man should have been able to get on board the plane if he was, in fact, all the things that they're right. saying. So who exactly was this sharp-dressed Indian man? And just what did he do, say, promise, or threaten to get this so-called terrorist on the plane. Mr. Haskell says he saw Abdul Matullab with a well-dressed man, and according to Mr. Haskell, the two were trying to get ticket agents to let him on board the plane without a passport. Well, that story now has Dutch authorities investigating the possibility of an accomplice. Uh, the suspect approached with a well-dressed Indian man. He, he looked like he was wealthy, uh, maybe around age 50. And obviously the, he wasn't the suspect Yeah, To me, he just like looked like a poor black teenager, maybe around 16 or 17 years old. They kind of looked like an odd couple to me, mm -hmm. and it kind of caught my curiosity. So I watched them as they approached the ticket agent, and I was about 10 feet away sitting on the floor, and it was pretty quiet. I could hear you know, the conversation pretty well, and, and only the Indian man spoke. And what he said was, this man needs to board the plane, and he doesn't have a passport. And the ticket agent then responded saying, well, you need a passport to board the plane. And the Indian man uh, then said, uh, he's from Sudan, so we do this all the time. And the ticket agent then responded, well, you'll need to go talk to my manager then, and uh, pointed the two men down a hallway, to which they then went down. Uh, and then... We subsequently boarded the plane. Uh, I never saw the Indian man again, and I never saw the black man again yeah. until he tried to blow up our plane. The well-dressed Indian man, um, uh -huh. was it your sense that he was an employee, perhaps, of security there, or the airport, or the airline, or not? That wasn't the impression that I got. He didn't have any kind of badge on or any kind of documents, and he didn't really seem to be acting in any kind of official capacity. It was more like he was trying to bully or convince this ticket agent that she needed to let this man on. Yeah, and obviously... Or, or like um, he was uh, some kind of authority figure to the terrorist. All right, so it's altogether possible he either convinced the manager or, as you pointed out on your blog, maybe there was a bribe involved. Yeah, you know, that's pure speculation on my part. I don't know. I don't really know. Right. All I know is that they went to see the security manager and later on, the terrorists ended up on the plane, and the Indian man did not. We may never know who the sharp-dressed Indian man was. The FBI has changed their story again and again, yet all the eyewitnesses have stuck to the story you just heard. Within days, the corporate media was selling naked body scanners to the American people as the solution to this staged event. We'll be getting new full body scanners as early as next week. It's the new question in the fight against terror. Are you willing to bear all for safety? Lourdes Duarte, live at O'Hare now with a uh, revealing look. Lourdes. Well, the time is here. In two weeks, we will have these full body scanners installed at O'Hare. Boston Logan International Airport officially unveiled three new body scanners on Friday that it hopes will help TSA agents better identify threats among air passengers. Just remember, it's all to keep you safe. And when you get cancer from going through these body scanners, that means more profits for the medical pharmaceutical industry. But they don't just scare you with snipers, mad bombers, and terror attacks. In 2009, America experienced its first staged pandemic. The never-before-seen variant of influenza was sensationalized by the media and the government. In April and May, we've seen more than a thousand deaths from pandemic influenza, 
and more than 20,000 hospitalizations in this country. President Obama declared a national H1N1 emergency. It was soon discovered that H1N1 virus had been manufactured in a laboratory, something that was not reported in the United States. H1N1 turned out to be much less severe than the common seasonal flu, but the scared and dumbed-down population paid billions of dollars to the drug companies and stood in huge lines to be injected with a poisonous cocktail of mercury, formaldehyde, and squalene that in the end did nothing to prevent H1N1 infection.